Hello and welcome to the interview. Our guest today was the first person born outside Tibet to lead the Tibetan government in exile. For two terms, he served as the political successor to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Joining us today on Beyond is Dr. Lobsang Sangye, the president of the Central Tibetan Administration. Dr. Sangye, welcome to Beyond. Good to be on your show, Pali. Uh, we speak at a time when the elections for the Tibetan parliament in exile are underway. The final round of polling is scheduled for the 13th of April. What do you make of the process so far? So far, we are very proud to say the democracy that was you know, gifted to us by His Solomon's Dalai Lama has been you know, performing very well. I think you can compare with uh, many other democratic countries in the world. And our democracy system is transparent. And unlike others, you know, where you have to pay freedom tax to vote. So unless, unless you pay your freedom tax, you cannot vote. So it's a very unique system. Tibetans in 30 plus countries all vote on single day. And so if you go all the way to Ladakh to the border, uh, some of the ballot boxes are carried on the backs of horses and ponies. And uh, some are, you know, voting in a very cozy air-conditioned room in New York. So from New Delhi to New York to New Zealand, Tibetans do take part and uh, participate. In, in the latest preliminary round, we had more than 80-plus percent turnout, even during the pandemic. So that shows that, you know, our democratic system and participation is uh, among the highest in the world. That's very good to know. The polls also come after a wave of aggressive actions from China. India, as you know, remains locked in a border standoff with China and Ladakh. And Beijing has also intensified its crackdown against minorities at home, including Tibetans. How do you assess China's actions? Well, unfortunately, in, the, in recent years, especially in the last decade, situation in Tibet has gone from bad to worse. Overall, uh, repression of Chinese people at large and Tibetans and uh, quote-unquote minorities like Uyghurs and Mongolians, even in Hong Kong, and the pressure felt in Taiwan are real. So what you see at the border of India is the, you know, centuries-old expansionist strategy of the Chinese government is at play. And repression within, uh, in, within China uh, towards Tibetans and Uyghurs and Mongolians I know they have been continuing for many decades. So for the last 60 years, we've been saying what happened to us, to Tibetans, could be a lesson for India. And many believe that you can befriend China, uh, you can appease China, you can get along with China. But now many people are realizing, in, including in India and Washington, D.C. and Europe, that, you know, that's not the way the Communist Party of China functions, you know. So we always say, you know, you have to verify, 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 then only trust. So we were betrayed before and we've been the victim so far. And uh, now people are turning around and believing our words. So, so this is a new beginning as far as China's, uh, you know, uh, their image is concerned. You're right, the world is learning the hard way. Uh, recent reports also claim that women in uh, Xinjiang's detention camps were subjected to rape and sexual abuse and torture, and we are calling it state-sanctioned rape in China. Last year, we also heard about detention camps in Tibet. Uh, do you think that even after everything that the world has suffered and seen, not enough is being done on global platforms to call out China and to stop its crackdown? Absolutely not, because the same party secretary, the Chinese person who was party secretary in Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, was sent to Xinjiang Autonomous Region as the party secretary. So the same architect of repression in Tibet uh, continued to repression in, in China. Uh, similarly, you know, we have been the patient zero uh, as far as repression is concerned. So violation of women rights and rapes are, you know, uh, you know, we have seen that in, in, in Tibet before. And, you know, it's really sad to hear uh, it's continuing uh, in uh, Uyghur areas as well. So this is how they intimidate, you know, Tibetans and Uyghurs and Mongolians, and this is how they also try to assimilate them. This is all centuries old policy to cultural discrimination, you know, and discouraging Tibetan language and other languages so that they could assimilate uh, Tibetans into Chinese, uh, you know, people. So there is political pressure, repression, there is economic uh, incentives and uh, pressure, and then there is forcive. Uh, 
you know, uh, forcibly, you know, marrying off or, you know, uh, raping, uh, you know, minority women are a you know, common occurrence. This is something that you've said in the past, what you just said, that when it comes to human rights violations, Tibet was patient zero. These are your words. In recent years, we've also seen how Tibetans have been, have been subjected to cultural genocide, as you mentioned, political indoctrination, forced labor. But when you, when you make statements like these, what does it mean for the middle way approach, the idea of limited autonomy for Tibetans within the Chinese system? Is that still possible after everything? Because this is something that the Dalai Lama has advocated and you have supported. Do you still agree with this, this solution? You know, the, as far as the patient zero is concerned, the Adrian Zen, the same author who did expose about labor camps in Xinjiang area, about Uyghurs, did the same expose wrote uh, about Tibet that, you know, from January of 2020 to July of 2020, in the last seven months, half a million Tibetans were uprooted from nomadic and rural areas into urban setting where they are given like military drill like training for what they call, you know, poverty elevation, skill training, but essentially it's cultural assimilation. Um, yes, these are horrible things that's happening, so we condemn all these things. Having said that, our policy remains middle way approach um, because it's a fact um, that, you know, because we believe in nonviolence, you know, we have to have dialogue to solve the issue and we have to come to a middle ground. So that's why, you know, China says one China cannot be compromised, their sovereignty cannot be compromised. Then His Holiness Dalai Lama said, okay, let's come to the middle and give us genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people. And, you know, within the framework of the Chinese constitution, we will take that as a solution. Now, for a rational, reasonable person, this is a win-win proposition. So yes, it, it is still on the table. Now, unfortunately, the Chinese leadership has been stubborn and unreasonable. That's why, you know, we continue to see repression in Tibet, but at the same time, resistance by the Tibetans, you know, 155 Tibetans have committed self-immolations. They have burned themselves. So recently, one uh, Tibetan youth was, you know, tortured to death uh, because of after the protest. So the resistance is continuing. That means the hardline policies of Chinese government is not succeeding. So middle way is the solution. Even after what happened to Hong Kong, what happened in Hong Kong, you believe limited autonomy under the Chinese rule is a viable solution? Now, that's what we like to believe. In, in Hong Kong, yes, they, was prom they were promised one country, two system, but, you know, uh, they went back on their words, you know, basic law, and they started violating, right? So if that continues, then that's problematic. But what we are saying is genuine autonomy Promise to Tibetans should be implemented as per the promise and as per the letter uh, of the, you know, the uh, agreement we will have. We all live in hope. Uh, the United States under Donald Trump's presidency began uh, drawing the world's attention to China's human rights abuses. And you had close ties with the Trump administration. You worked well with them. What are your expectations from Joe Biden? And do you believe that this new American administration can continue with that momentum to corner China on the issue of human rights? Yeah, we are uh, grateful to the previous administration for passing two major bills and signed them into law, the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act and the Tibet Policy and Support Act. Now, these are laws. Now, the new administration and the administra administration thereafter, they will have to implement it. Now, as far as President uh, Joe Biden is concerned, he promised when he was a candidate that he would meet with His Holiness Dalai Lama and he will... Uh, punish those Chinese officials who violate human rights of the Tibetan people. And, you know, he was the vice president uh, during Obama's time, and he was also a senator and a you know, chairman of Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So he has met with His Holiness Dalai Lama before, and he has spoken on and acted on Tibet issues before. So we are confident uh, that the new administration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will continue the bipartisan support for Tibetan cause. Just this week, China's top diplomat also warned America that the issues of Hong Kong, Tibet and Xinjiang are quote-unquote red lines. That's the term he used, uh, that America cannot cross. What do you make of such threats from Beijing? Well, you know, if you look at the past decades, you know, they always uh, come out with threats and they always say these are the red lines. And often, you know, they cross the red lines themselves. 
Uh, for example, when it comes to trade war or the re their tough relationship with China, the Chinese leadership always says, you know, we must have a win-win solution. We must have a dialogue. We must solve these issues, you know, that way. But when it comes to Tibet, we, when we say, let's have dialogue, and through which, you know, let's find an amicable solution, they say no to you, right? So what Chinese leaders, uh, leadership says uh, is different when it comes to their own uh, promises and implementation. So what they talk about red line is their red line, but you know many have crossed and nothing has happened. And you know in some cases when they cross, they try to penalize it. For example, Australia is going through that experience, and Nor Norway, Denmark, and Canada have been through that. Uh, but you know America being America, uh, you know uh, I don't think if they want to cross the red line, they will cross the red line, and nothing much happens. For example. Passing the Tibet, uh, you know, Tibetan Policy and Support Act clearly is a red line, but you know, U.S. Congress passed it and President signed it. It's a law now, and nothing has happened in the last, uh, you know, few months. Do you believe that pressure is going to be felt by the people of Tibet? Or do you fear that a tough stand by America and the rest of the world, perhaps, would intensify China's abuses in Tibet and elsewhere? Um, definitely, yes. People in Tibet are looking for hope. As you said, we, uh, you know, we always uh, live in the world of hope, and hope, in some sense, you know, uh, is everything for many people, right? Hope, it's an essential component of life. Each, each morning when you get up, if you don't have hope, then the, the, you have difficulty passing the day and the weeks and the months, you know? So especially when you're in struggle, uh, hope is everything. So when Tibetan Policy and Support Act was passed and the statements were issued uh, by the American Congress, I think Tibetans in Tibet welcome it because they are suffering on a daily basis, you know. They feel the brunt of repression. In the, in the dark cells of Chinese prison, you know, the political prisoners are listening and they're, they're thinking what's, what is going on around the world. And when you have a message of hope and a message of support, they appreciate it, you know, and their spirit is high and the resistance will continue because ultimately what's happening in Tibet is unjust. And we all must fight for justice and speak for justice and show support for justice. So that's what Tibetans in Tibet want, and we all are doing the best we can to do it. Indeed, and India has always had a very special relationship with Tibet and Tibetans. What role would you like Delhi to play to highlight China's human rights abuses beyond what is being already done? Yes, on the one hand, we always accept, um, agree that India has done the most for Tibetans because the largest number of Tibetans are here. The, all the monasteries and cultural institutions that were destroyed in Tibet were rebuilt here. And we have revived our civilization culture right here in India, thanks to the government and leaders of India and the people of India. Having said that, you know, India also, in some ways, you know, uh, gave away Tibet. You know, when Tibet was invaded and occupied in 1950s, uh, India could have, you know, uh, done a bit more than what was done uh, or continues to do. Uh, for example, even the news media calls, you know, it's Indo-China border. So when the uh, Chinese troops come to Galwan Valley and crosses the river and you know, violence uh, ensued and you know, media included, in intellectuals, everybody are complaining. Why are they crossing the border? Why are they here? But the fact that when you said Tibet you know, is part of China, the Chinese, border, Chinese troops will say, yes, I'm coming to my territory because you say so. You say it's China's border, I've come to the border, right? Now the argument is over. No, no, I, we meant across the river. We meant that mountaintop, not this mountaintop, right? When you have already given up 2.5 million square kilometers of land, almost two-thirds of India's land size, when you argue about one mount mountain top or the across the river or this road or the that road, right? It sounds so small. So I think India should not lose the larger picture. Historically, it was always a border between Tibet and India. So I think the former uh, finance minister of Tibet said he he wrote it to Pandit Nehru also. At the moment, India has only 75 security personnel guarding the border. That's all it was needed to guard, you know, uh, such a long border, right? Only 75 personnel. Now, if India doesn't intervene, the price will be huge down the line. 
Now, you know, even at Galwan area only, we hear in the news media that 30,000 some Indian troops from this side and 30,000 from the Chinese side have come. And billions of dollars are spent on a yearly basis just for the security. So when Tibet was independent, only 75 Indian soldiers were guarding the border. So cost was less than a small village security, you know. So uh, now we are paying a huge price. Uh, so, you know, India also has to accept uh, that unless you solve the Tibet issue, the peace or harmony between India and China is not likely. Yes, I think uh, some mistakes of history uh, cost, uh, cost governments dear. Uh, many say the succession of the 14th Dalai Lama is the next flashpoint between Tibetans and, uh, and China. Uh, you know that the United States Congress passed the Tibet Policy and Support Act. You've mentioned it, a law that says the right to choose the next Dalai Lama falls with the Tibetans. Do you expect India to take a similar stand? Um, yes, right to choose His Holiness Dalai Lama, or for that matter, any Green Dalai Lama should be exclusively with the Tibetans because we invented the reincarnation tradition, you know. So we have full uh, patent and copyright over it, right? So uh, Chinese uh, government can, you know, manufacture duplicates, but duplicates are duplicates, original is original, right? Now, as far as India is concerned, it's a, you know, it's a very simple uh, stand. For 5,000 plus years, the Swamis and Sankaracharyas or any religious leaders are selected or elected by the people of their faith. Government never intervened. So this has been an you know, age-old uh, stand of India. So all India needs to say is yes, among all the Hindu religion, uh, what do you call, uh, denominations or Christian or any faith in India, religious leaders are selected or elected by the people of that faith. Similarly, as far as Dalai Lama and other incarnations are concerned, Tibetans should have the final say and Chinese government should not have any say, nor India will interfere in this, nor China uh, should interfere in this. So, you know, this is a clear-cut stand. I think India has 5,000 years of history and evidence to back it up. Yes, but China is not India. China also interferes with the Catholic Church and decides who the bishops will be. Uh, so you're dealing with a different beast. How do you think the Tibetan community will respond to China's attempts to pick the next Dalai Lama? Well, we'll say it's nonsense. Um, because, you know, after the invasion and occupation of Tibet, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99% of monks and nuns were destroyed. Our religious artifacts were burned and looted. Our scriptures were burned for weeks and months. So if you look at the track history of the last 60 years, the Chinese government has done nothing but destroy, discourage Buddhism. So with that kind of track record and the Communist Party, which believes in you know, atheism and says religion is poison, why are they interested in reincarn reincarnation of Dalai Lamas or for that matter, any other Lamas? So his Holiness jokingly says, but partly true, if the Chinese Communist Party is so, you know, uh, is so interested in reincarnation, then they must find the reincarnation of Mao Zedong and Chao Enlai and Chu Te, the founding fathers of Communist Party, and then uh, build some credibility, then they can say now, you know, we are going to extend it to other Lamas as well, right? So. They don't practice reincarnation in the Communist Party system. And as far as spirituality is concerned, they have no faith. And their track record is destruction and destruction and, you know, discouragement. So they have zero credibility. So we will accept our Dalai Lama and our reincarnated Lamas, our ways. That, that's, you know, that's how we have done it for the last thousand years. And that will continue. These are also your last days in office. Is there anything that you regret not getting done? And uh, would you like the next administration uh, to accomplish some of your unfinished business? You know, the number one priority is always to elevate the sufferings of six million Tibetans in Tibet, you know. So this has been our challenge for the last 60 years. And during my term too, you know, I always felt if I could do something to improve the situation, you know, and... Uh, so that always remains a regret because, you know, when you hear 155 Tibetans have committed self-immolation, I think 153 or four uh, during my time, right, 
each time you read about them, you know, each time the news come uh, to your table, uh, each time the uh, prisoner like the youth who was just tortured to death recently, you know, uh, each time you hear that someone, you know, is, is suffering and then Tashi Wangchu, the, he was simply arguing for bilingual, uh, you know, right to education. Uh, and then he was, you know, sent to prison for five years. So when you hear the sentences and you just feel uh, sad and you just feel, you know, it's very painful uh, that our own brothers and sisters have to go through so much of pain and so much of suffering, you know. Uh, and then you always think um, that, you know, I could do a little better uh, than what I have been uh, able to do. Other than that, yes. All the camping promises that I made in terms of economy and political and outreach, um, things like that, you know, I've uh, by and large fulfilled. And what are your post-retirement plans? What kind of role uh, do you see yourself uh, playing in the future for the autonomy of Tibet? Well, I am a Tibetan, born as a Tibetan. Until I die, I'll remain a Tibetan uh, and a patriot one. So I'll continue to serve, you know, uh, in one capacity or the other. So that's our, um, you know, lifelong duty uh, for the cause. Having said that, I've served, you know, full time for 10 years. I have done my part. And I'm also a father of a young daughter who is going to go to high school, and I have barely have four years with her. After that, once she goes to college, you know, I won't be able to see her that often. So I have a responsibility as a father too. So I have to balance now a bit of family and public service. So if I can balance the two, uh, I think at the end of my life, when I look back, I can say, yes, I was a decent father and a you know, uh, decent, what do you call, uh, patriot for the cause. That's setting a very good example. Who served his soul and his diadema faithfully. Yes. Are you also writing a book? Well, uh, some people are asking me to, but some people are saying I'm too young to write a book. So, you know, a Tibetan version should come out, you know, to set the track, should, should set the record straight. Well, you're never too young to write a book. Thank you very much, Dr. Sangay. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much, Belkiji.